Hi, my name is Joseph. I was born as a child um, with uh, four fingers on each hand. Doesn't have a disease name or was diagnosed uh, with you know anything by doctors. Uh, it was just something that I was born with. Everything started going on. I started going going through elementary school and middle school. Um, you know, I had lots of friends. Uh, people wanted to be around me. There, there was uh, one moment where there was um, a girl, and she said, uh, "Joe, you know, if you had that, if you didn't have that problem uh, with you, uh, you probably could have anyone in the world. You probably can do anything in the world that you wanted to do." It took me a couple of steps back, and I realized that um, that I was different. No matter what I seemed to do. I had in the back of my mind that I was I was I was considered less. I felt like I was going to do more to to gain more respect, or you know, for for people to like me, or for people to accept me. And so I had the opportunity to open up my own restaurant, and you know, I pretty much emptied out my 401k and borrowed money from from friends and whoever I could to to help me out at that moment, and just pretty much poured every resource I could. I felt accomplished. Um, you know, I put my birth defect uh, to the side. I felt like I had done something that many people um, have dreamed of. And I actually was considered someone that people looked at and admired. It was at that point where my marriage was struggling. Um, I was working um, late nights, you know, working 14, 16, 18 hour days um, every day. I felt like I, I never was going to be able to amount to what what my dreams and admirations were to be was to be this businessman that that ran a successful business. It was it was at that point where um, I knew that I needed to find another source. I'm not sure what your story is, but I think every one of us can relate to Joe's, and that is because every one of us at some point in life have had someone say you can't, or you'll never. Maybe they saw something in us that was lacking or missing, and so they created in our life an invisible boundary that limited us, maybe even defined us. For 2,000 years of sports history, as people ran, no one had ever run, ran a sub-four-minute mile. In fact, uh, in the 1940s, the world record got down to four minutes and one second. And over the next several years, experts got together and began to hypothesize that it was actually not just dangerous to run a sub four minute mile, but it was physically impossible. I mean, no one had ever done it. 2,000 years, no one, the most, you know, the best athletes in the world had never been able to run under a four minute mile until nine, minute, nine years after it had gotten down to 401. Roger Bannister on May 6, 1954, ran the mile in 3 minutes, 59.4 seconds. And suddenly, what had been an invisible wall was broken. That might not sound like a big deal, but here's what happened next. After 2,000 years of no one ever doing it, Roger Bannister does it, and six weeks later, his friend John Landy ran it in three minutes, 57.9 seconds, lowering the world record another one and a half seconds, which again, might not sound like a really big deal, but for 2,000 years, they couldn't lower it one second, and in six weeks, it went from 359.4 to 357.9. Within that year, three more people ran a sub four minute mile. Then the next year, five more got runners broke the four minute barrier. Today, it is common for the, for the best athletes to run a sub four minute mile, meaning this is happening in track meets all around the world. How is it that for 2,000 years, no one did it? And then within two years, 11 people did it. And then for this point, it's just common. Is it just that we're, you know, there's better training, better equipment? No, no, no. Here's what happened. The only reason everyone says it can't be done is because no one ever has done it. The only reason you believe it can't be done is because you've never done it before. And what happens is because other people say it can't be done, it creates an invisible barrier in our mind to believe it can't be done. But as soon as there's breakthrough, there's breakthrough for everyone because as soon as it's done, it can be done. You see the shift? And some of us, we're stuck. In fact, you're trapped right now. You're trapped inside of the boundaries of invisible lines other people have put around your life. They put them there because of their fears, 
their failures, their biases, their prejudices, their ignorance. And then you picked it up. You know where insecurities come from? Insecurities are when we personalize the fears, failures, biases, prejudices, and ignorance of others. And we make it our own. We believe what they're selling. And when you pick up the fears and failures of others, you become insecure. And our insecurities drive us. They drive us to work long hours and to spend sleepless nights because here's what we're trying to do. Insecurities drive us to attempt to earn our self-worth through what we do rather than who we are. Did you catch that? If right now you are trying to find your value in something you are doing, it's because you're being driven by insecurity. And so what do you do? How do you overcome this? How do you get beyond the trap of these invisible barriers, these glass ceilings that have put a lid on your life? Well, I at least want to introduce you to a woman named Deborah. Deborah, like Joe, had some invisible boundaries around her life. And this sto- her story is found in the Bible. It's found in the Old Testament in a book called Judges. It's called Judges because it's a story of various leaders over the nation of Israel who were referred to as judges. They judged and oversaw the nation. And the nation of Israel was in a chronic cycle of trouble. They would do the wrong thing. They would suffer severe consequences because they were turning their back on God and doing evil. The way they would suffer is enemies would come in, conquer their land, oppress them, abuse them, rob them, and steal their possessions. In their misery, they would cry out to God. God would raise up a ruler, a judge, who would lead them in battle, conquer their enemies, and then they would have a season of peace. And so long as the ruler lived, they would enjoy this peace. But when the ruler died, they would go back to doing whatever they wanted to do, and they would walk away from God. And so we're going to pick up the story in... Judges chapter 4, and that's exactly what's happening. After the death of Ehud, the judge, we spoke about him last week. He's the guy who stabbed the enemy king in the gut, and then he led them. This is crazy stuff, right? He led them in victory in battle. After he died, um, the nation of Israel went back to doing whatever they wanted. They turned their back on God. They did evil. And so now they come under the oppressive rule of Jabin, king who rules in Hazor. Interestingly, this king uh, was probably his great, 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 great grandfather was someone that Joshua led the nation of Israel to defeat 150 years later, later. Or earlier. And it's interesting because that's, there's a lesson in there, isn't it? And that is when you turn your back on God, enemies that you had victory over in the past will defeat you in the present. When we turn our back on God and start doing our own thing, issues in our life that we thought we defeated will rise back up and begin to oppress us and beat us down. And so it's a good warning sign there, but we're going to continue here. The people cried out to God. And God raised up a ruler, but God raised up a ruler that was incredibly unlikely. Verse 4, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. So God raises up Deborah. Her name actually interestingly means like mother bee or queen bee. And uh, that's just a little side note. You're going to find that useful in just a moment. But here is the deal. Deborah is an unlikely choice. Why? Because in this era, women were considered the most vulnerable and weakest individuals in society. And even in a nation ruled by God, there was a view of women that women were dependent on men and women did not have a responsibility ever to lead. In fact, it was commonly understood that God, when he raised up leaders, would raise up men. And so for God to use a woman was not just an unlikely choice, but God was making a point. And it was this, the the people were looking for people, you know, for a ruler that they could identify with, that they would say, yeah, that guy is going to lead us into battle. They wanted a great warrior, a great leader, a great commander. And so God raises up a woman to make a point. Stop trusting in people that you think can lead you. Stop looking for great warriors and start looking to me to fight for you. Start trusting me to lead you. And so God raises up an unlikely choice, Deborah, to lead them. And so Deborah uh, identifies a commander for her army. She chooses Barak. And the story continues in verse 8. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, 
I won't go, meaning I'm not going into battle unless you're by my side. Could you, you see the irony in this? Here is an unlikely choice in Deborah, and then there's Barak, who's supposed to be this warrior commander, and he's like, I'm not even going to battle unless, Deborah, you come with me. And uh, here is, here's a guy who's weak-willed, and he's got a poor constitution, and he's indecisive in moments of pressure, not exactly the heroic type. And so because of this moment, Deborah says to him, Here's the deal. You are going to lead our army into a great victory, but you're not going to get any credit for it. Because of your cowardice in this moment, God is going to take the victory and the credit you should have gotten, and he's going to give it to another unlikely hero, another woman. And this is exactly how the story plays out. Let me quickly walk you through it. So Barak goes out to battle. He's outgunned. Uh, he's, it, it says that... Um, uh, of 40,000 soldiers, none of them have any weapons. That's bad. And they're facing an army that has the, the most like in innovative weapons of their time, iron chariots. And so they're facing a highly weaponized enemy, and they've got nothing. Uh, of, of their soldiers, 40,000 of them have no weapons, and they're outmanned. They've got an army, but they're facing a much larger army, and they're outpositioned. They're not only flanked, but they've got the low ground, and the enemy has the high ground, a position that's best to conquer your enemies. And so they're outmanned, outgunned, outpositioned, exactly as God set them up, because God has a way of putting you in unlikely positions so that it's obvious that you're going to be defeated, so that if you get the victory, it's obvious that God won the victory. And so God will sometimes put us into a setup where we go, this is impossible, so that when he shows up, he can show off and he gets all the credit. And that's exactly what happens. As they're routing their enemy, the commander of that army named Sisera runs for his life. And he runs to a, a, an allied town. He goes into that village or that, where there's tents set up where the people are living. And he finds one of his close friends and he runs to that tent where his friend's wife is outside of the tent. Her name is Jael, and she invites him into the tent to hide. And he says, protect me, cover me up so that the enemy doesn't destroy me. And she says, sure. She gives him milk. Oh, and, and it puts him to sleep. Not just cool water, but milk, and it soothes him, and he goes to sleep. And while he's sleeping, this woman takes a tent peg and a hammer. I'm telling you, this is all like Braveheart stuff. This is hardcore. And she puts the tent peg on his temple and then, poof, and see? And you thought, you thought the Bible was just like a bunch of religious rules of do's and don'ts and obligations. You had no idea that there was full-on wars and tent pegs and hammers and women killing this Sisera, the commanding you know, uh, leader, right? Check this out. So she kills Sisera. There's a great victory that day for Israel. And guess who gets all the credit? In a flash, the, gl the glory of the victory, the, the credit of the victory goes to Jael rather than to Barak. And it's exactly as Deborah said. But there's a point to all of this. Why would I share this story with you? Because maybe you're like Deborah and there's some cultural barriers or there's some bias or prejudice or there's some walls that others have put around your life and you're bumping up against them. Here's what I want you to know. This is the, the main point I want you to take away. This is what I want you to write down in your smartphone or tablet as you're taking notes today. I would challenge you to take notes on this because these principles have a way of getting missed, but when you write them down, when you type them in, they have a way of going from your hand to your head and eventually they make their way to your heart so they become a habit in your life. Do you guys catch that hand? Head, heart, habit. All right. See, I worked on that one all week. All right, here we go. Um, here, here's what I want you to write down. When others say you can't, God can. Don't miss that. Now, some of you all, you thought we were going to have a big counseling session here. This is going to be a group self-help uh, meeting, and we were going to all get together and sing kumbaya and say, oh, we can do it. You can overcome your insecurities. You know, you're wonderful. You're beautiful. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is when you, when others say you can't, God can. The truth is you can't. And it's not just because of your insecurities. It's not just because of others' fears that have become your walls. 
It's not just because you have your own limitations. It's not just because Joe was born with four fingers on a hand instead of a you know, full five. And it's not because of what others have said about you. What limits us is more than just a barrier. It's actually an enemy that has defeated us. It's called sin. Sin is the reason Israel kept falling back into their own wicked, evil ways because sin corrupts our way of thinking. Sin corrupts our desires. Sin causes us to believe that what is wrong is right. Sin cuts us off from relationship with God so that we are separated from right relationship with God. We're cut off from eternal life. We're cut off from what is right and good. And as a result, you and I are on a crash course with eternal judgment. Not just physical death, but a forever suffering as the result of this life of sin. That's the bad news. And that's the same news that the nation of Israel was chronically living in. But just like God sent Deborah to lead them into victory, God has intervened in your mess and my mess to give us victory over sin. And God did it through Jesus. In fact, in this story, I want you to see that Jesus is alluded to through Deborah. Deborah points us to Jesus. Let me show you how. Deborah was an unlikely choice. No one would have picked Deborah. No one would have picked Jesus. A poor man born into a poor family in an oppressed nation under the Roman rule, being abused and taken advantage of. Jesus, who the religious elite scoffed at and mocked. They nailed him to a Roman cross to kill him. But just like J.L., used an unlikely instrument in a hammer and tent peg. Jesus chose the most unlikely of instruments, a wooden Roman cross, and he was nailed to the cross. But when he hung on that cross, he wasn't dying for what he deserved, but what, for what we deserve. What put Jesus on the cross was our sin. Because when he went to the cross, he was dying in our place. The eternal death sentence you and I deserve, he took on himself. The punishment that we face, he absorbed. So that when he died, he died once, for all. His death, the eternal suffering we deserve. So that in his death, we died. When you believe in Jesus by faith, you are forgiven of your sins, guilt and shame removed, and you are given new and eternal life. God's eternal spirit comes into our eternal spirits. And when God's spirit is united with our spirit, we become truly alive. Now check this out. Some of you, you've heard this before, and so you're, you're starting to check out on me a little bit. Listen carefully. When God's spirit enters into your spirit, the definition of who you are is changed. You are not what you once were. You are not who you were. You are not defined by what you once were. You are not limited, but by what has previously limited you. The invisible barriers that once held you back do not hold God back. So that when you believe in Jesus by faith, you are changed so that you can capture this moment. Don't miss this. So, so I want you to write down. So I want you to type in. Rather than being limited by the insecurities from the invisible lines of others, we must find our identity in God. What defines you? Is it what others have said? Is it the fear and failures of others that they've placed on you? Is it the bias and prejudice and ignorance of others that has put a, put a boundary around your life? Or are you finding your identity meaning your definition in Jesus. See, Jesus changes everything for every one of us. And, I, and we got to make this practical now. And so I asked Joe if he'd share a little bit more of his story. So check this out. I remember clear as day, I was cleaning up the restaurant. You know, I was sad about looking at receipts and things that bills that I owed. And um, where I heard God speak to me loud and clear. And he said, you know, if I'm not in the midst of everything that you do, it's not going to work out. No matter what club you open, no matter what job you have, it, it's not going to work unless I fully devote myself to him. And it was at that moment where I knew that I needed to close the restaurant down. So now I'm, I'm excited to say that, you know, that God has actually, you know, just totally just brought a new light into my life. Now I feel like I'm no longer walking in a, a dark tunnel. Uh, now I actually feel like I'm actually handed the flashlight and everything I do now I have that light that's guiding me through. I no longer think about my, uh, my hands as a disability. Uh, 
God has uh, clearly uh, used my my disability and, and, and my hands to to bring joy uh, to people with uh, through music and uh, through laughter and through greeting um, and even through worship. The limitations and the disabilities that the world um, you know might label me as you know I've I've become greater than that. Now God is using those same labels and disabilities to to impact the world in, in a mighty way. So now I'm actually living the vision and living the dream. I love that we can just share some of the stories of individuals in and who are part of LifeHouse because it has a way, I get it. Sometimes you read the stories in the Bible or you hear your pastor preach it and you're like, man, I'm glad that God uses those kind of people. I'm, God, I'm glad that God works in someone else's life, but he can't do it in my life. And I know people like Joe, they, that's exactly how they feel. And when you hear Joe say it, you're like, hey, Maybe, maybe if God can do that in Joe's life, he can do it in my life. See, it, it, and that's exactly what Deborah was like. She was just one of us, just a regular person who felt limited by insecurities and the invisible boundaries that other people put on us. But then when you discover your value and your identity in Jesus, it changes everything. When you discover the value you have in God, your identity in God, it changes your story. And that's what I want you to take away. I want you to get this. Here it is, right? I want, we're going to go back. We're going to read a, a little bit of this song that Deborah wrote after they won the battle. And it's found in Judges chapter 5. And I'm going to read verse 5 and a couple other verses here. The mountains quake before the Lord, the one of Sinai. And that's a reference to back to this uh, great leader deliverer, Moses, who brought the nation out of Egypt and out of slavery. And they marched to... Uh, near the mountain of Sinai, Mount Sinai, where God invited Moses to go up on the mountain and he gave them the Ten Commandments. All right, some of you, maybe you haven't heard that story, but you're, you've heard of the Ten Commandments. But what God did was he revealed his presence powerfully on Sinai, where the whole entire mountain shook. God revealed himself in thunder and in lightning, and the people were in awe and they stepped away from the base of the mountain overwhelmed by the power of God. And, and so Deborah's making this point. She goes, before you, O oh God, mountains bow down. They quake in your presence before the Lord, the God of Israel. Maybe there's mountains in your life that are getting in the way, but God wants you to know that he is creator he can do the unlikely. He can even make mountains bow down in his presence. Village life in Israel ceased, Deborah said, meaning the enemy had so rocked us and so shut us down that everything had gone quiet. Ceased until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. You see how she connected her name? She's like me until God raised me up to be a mother bee over Israel. Then everything changed. When they chose new gods, war came to their city gates. And she's making a point that when uh, the nation of Israel turned their back on God, they chose to follow other gods, then war came right to their villages. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. She goes, we had no weapons. We were outgunned, outmanned. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. She goes... As a, as a mother bee, God raised me up to set the people free, but not because of who I am, but because of who God is. And that's the point, right? Don't miss this. Here, here's what I want you to catch. You, your identity is changed because of the value you have in God's eyes. It's not about your self-worth. It's about your God worth. Your value is not based on what you can do, or what others have said about you. Your value is based on how God sees you, what God says about you, and what he was willing to pay for you. And he was willing to pay for you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, his only son. You are worth the death of God. You are worth dying for. And Jesus was willing to give his life because he loves you so much that he did not want to spend eternity without you. Thank you. All right, somebody... Somebody got it. All right. Which means I can say this. I am chosen by God. You can say I am chosen by God. In fact, can I encourage you right now? Would you say I, I am, chosen am chosen by God. 
I am chosen by God. When your insecurities say, God can't, and I won't, and I'll never, I want you to change the script in your mind. I want you to stop playing that over and over. I'll never, I can't. And I want you to start saying, I am chosen by God. I am chosen by God. I am chosen by God. Deborah gets it. She said, my name defined me. And God raised me up, not because of who I am, but because of who God is. See, the point of the story is not Deborah, this great warrior woman who overthrows the shackles of misogyny and cultural constructs. It's not about, you know, the two heroines, Deborah and Jael, and about these guys who are not. No, the story is that God is the hero. The point of the story is that God chose Deborah and God chose Jael and it's God who does the choosing. It's God who does the loving. In fact, we were running the wrong direction. We rejected God and he rescued us. We betrayed God and he pursued us. We said no and God said yes. God chose you and God chose me and that should give you a profound sense of identity. I'm valued and loved by God because Jesus loves me. My entire identity is shaped by the price he put on my life, which was giving his life. Stop being so insecure. You and I, were all insecure. I get it. I might be one of the more insecure people in this room. But what I discovered is who cares? It's not about my insecurities. It's about the security I have in Jesus Christ. Get over your insecurities by discovering the security you have in Jesus. And when you discover that, oh, oh, you start to carry yourself with a little more courage and a little more confidence. You start to see the value that God put on your life. Again, not because of who you are or what you can do, but because of who he is and what he can do in your life and what he can do through your life. You get it? I am chosen by God, which means God is not limited by what limits us. God is not confined to the choices others should be made or will be making for us. God can choose from the most unlikely of places to do the most unlikely things. He is not limited by what limits us. He is not insecure about our insecurities, which then allows us to take a final step. Verse 2 and 3 of chapter 5, this is the beginning of the song that Deborah sings. When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. So she's making kind of a, a warrior chant. She's like, all right, come on, all you kings across the globe, listen carefully. Listen, you rulers, I will sing to the Lord. I will sing. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. There's one God. There is one king, and he is the king above all kings. There is one Lord, and he is the Lord over all lords. There is one God, and he rules over all nations. And I want you to know that our value is in doing the part God's called us to play. So leaders are called to lead. People are called to willingly serve. And all of us are called to worship. See, here's the point. Our value is found when we begin to do our part in the great story of God. I am chosen by God. And I am chosen for a purpose. God did not choose you to leave you on the sidelines. God did not invite you in his story to be a byline. God did not pay the price for your eternal salvation to leave you stagnant and going nowhere. God has chosen you for a destiny. God has designed you for destiny. He has marked you for a purpose. God has given you this moment in time in this chapter of history because he wants to uniquely work through your life in a way that no one else could do your part so stop being so insecure get over it get over yourself get over it let's go beyond the invisible barrier see God is not confined by the barriers that have defined us God has chosen you specifically because everyone else said you can't so that when he can it's obvious only he did it do you catch that I feel like some of y'all are just like Really? All right, here's the deal. 
Deborah recognizes leaders lead, people serve, everyone worships, everyone has a unique part. But it's all pointing to God so that the nations notice kings acknowledge the king. Other nations bow before the God where, who, to, before whom mountains bow. Your responsibility is to discover your unique part in why you were chosen by God. Begin to function in that part, overcoming and going beyond your insecurities so that your life points to Jesus, so that your life becomes a part of the story of God. It is not about you being the hero. Right? This story was not about Deborah. It's not about JL. The story is to make it obvious that God chooses unlikely people to do the most unlikely things. God set up the battle so that they would be outmanned, outgunned, outpositioned, so that God could show off that he is the victor. He is the great warrior. He is the king. He is the one to whom all armies must surrender and mountains bow down. And your life, your value, your significance is found in being obedient to the work of God. I am chosen by God and I am chosen for a purpose. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12, the Apostle Paul, or verse 10, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes this, for we are God's workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Don't you limit what God can do in and through your life by your own insecurities and self-doubts. I realize you might be doubting yourself, but don't doubt God. You might have limits on your abilities, but don't believe that God is limited by your inabilities. You might be questioning what you can accomplish But let's not question what God can accomplish through us. Look, I I know I've had it in my life. I had a specific moment that I can look back on over and over and over again. Before I moved to Hagerstown, before we began Lifehouse, I was scared out of my mind. I felt like a failure. I felt like giving up. I felt like I couldn't do it. And I had a prayer moment when, when I felt like God just whispered in my ear, Patrick, do you believe I could do something great in your life? But it was at a point of darkness for me, a point of complete, I felt like failure. And I, and I remember praying and saying, God, no, I, I really don't. And I can remember in prayer, just that whisper of God's spirit somewhere inside of you. Him saying to me, Patrick, you're not doubting yourself, you're doubting me. And you're not questioning yourself, you're questioning me. And I, I had this like chill moment, like, whoa. And I said, God, far be it for me to question you. You do whatever you want with my life. If you choose to do little, so be it. If you choose to do much, so be it. I mean, that's literally how I prayed. And I can remember that moment to this day like it was yesterday. And, and I can, and I, so now for me, everything God has ever done through my life since that moment, I look back in that prayer moment, I remember, yep, it was only God. See, God, you might be questioning yourself, but don't question God. He wants to do something great in your life. And so now here's your opportunity. Some of you, You're at the place where you're still being incredibly limited, even sabotaged by sin. And you're not gonna overcome that on your own. No, Jesus already overcame it for you. And so this is your moment to surrender to Jesus Christ as the king of your life and the Lord of your heart. Would you receive him as the savior who rescues you from sin? If that's where you're at, then this is your moment to pray and say, Jesus, I believe in you. I'm willing to repent of my old way of living and I'm willing to give you my life and I invite your spirit into my spirit. And if that's where you're at right now, you make this your prayer moment. For others of you, you believe in Jesus, but you're doubting him because you're doubting what he can do in your life. And it's time for you to say, I am chosen by God and I was chosen for a purpose. So would you take a moment and pray? Bow your heads right now. Just let God's spirit begin to speak to you. Some of you, your whole life is being rewritten right now. God wants to begin to write a new story with your life. He wants to overcome the insecurities, those fears and doubts. So would you surrender to him? Take a moment, let's pray. We hope that you've enjoyed today's experience. We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations, welcome to the family and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the give tab or you can visit our website and click give. 
We are so thankful that you joined us and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.